Last week, Vladimir Putin was speaking at the Russian-led Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok in Russia's Far East. He took part in a panel discussion with Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim and Chinese Vice President Han Sen. During the panel, he also spoke about Europe's irrational decision to decouple from Russian energy and that he'd be willing at any time to negotiate sending again gas through the one remaining Nord Stream pipeline that is still functional. I'll give some more comments after the video, but first an English translation of what Mr. Putin actually said. But Ukraine is refusing our transit. This means that the volumes of gas flowing to Europe will decrease. Gas will go through other routes, in particular through the Turkish stream and perhaps partly through the Blue Stream to Turkey, although that is intended for domestic consumption. Nevertheless, this will contribute to energy stability in Europe. But that is their choice. How it will affect them, I do not know. We are dealing with our issues, and they can deal with theirs. You see, the attitude towards their issues by allies and partners, which many demonstrate in the United States and in Ukraine, looks very strange. For me, this is simply incomprehensible. A gas pipeline, Nord Stream, was blown up on the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Both lines of Nord Stream 1 and one line of Nord Stream 2 were destroyed. By the way, one line still exists and is operational. What prevents the German government from pressing the button, negotiating with us, and turning it on? How much is it? 25 billion cubic meters through one line. 27.5 billion cubic meters of gas could immediately go to Europe, to Germany. I don't understand why they are not doing this. They can receive gas through the territory of Ukraine. They can receive it through the Turkish stream, but they cannot through the line that runs along the bottom of the Baltic Sea. In my opinion, this is some kind of professional defamation, schizophrenia, just nonsense. Why? If they don't want it, then they don't have to. We will gradually increase our supplies to other regions of the world, including the People's Republic of China. We have a good project for supplies to China that was developed even before all these crises in Europe and in the Ukrainian direction. Next year, we will reach a project capacity of 38 billion cubic meters. Plus, from the Far East, from Sakhalin to Vladivostok, we also plan to supply another 10 billion cubic meters to China. We are exploring other routes. I repeat, this is in no way related to the events in Ukraine. These are our agreements that were reached many years ago. We will implement all of this. Additionally, we will develop liquefied gas. Yes, they are trying to create a problem for us, but it is still developing, and Russia's share in the supply of liquefied natural gas to global markets is gradually increasing. It is not as large as we would like, but we will continue despite the difficulties they are trying to create for us. What is the problem? No matter who tries to shut down our energy sector, it is impossible because production is at its limit according to the needs of the global market. It is simply impossible. You understand? Let's imagine that everything closes tomorrow, gas, oil, and so on. But the world economy will not withstand such a closure. Prices will simply skyrocket, but people will still buy. It is impossible without it. This is the essence of the matter. When our adversaries and those who impose illegal restrictions, as mentioned by the Vice Chairman of the People's Republic of China, do this, they act not out of great wisdom, as they say in such cases, but from pure heart. There is no result. They are guided only by arrogance and overconfidence. And the outcome turns out to be the opposite of what was expected. Therefore, we will solve our issues. Yes, perhaps with some losses, but we will still resolve them. And those who do not want to cooperate with us will bear the losses. We see what is happening in European countries. Many of them are teetering on the brink of recession and the situation will worsen.
потому что те, кто поставляют им энергоресурсы, заботятся прежде Because those who supply them with energy resources primarily care about their own national interests, including in the United States. They supply two to three times more than our energy carriers, for example, gas. Of course, Europe's economy, including Germany, which depends on our energy carriers, is undergoing serious trials. Many industries are simply shutting down. But this is not our choice. We are ready. Please negotiate with Poland to open the pipeline systems. They exist. Yamal, Western Europe. The Poles have closed them, and now Ukraine is closing another route. Nord Stream 2 at the bottom of the Baltic Sea is not being activated. If they don't want to, that's fine. It will be a loss for them. For us, there will be a certain reduction in revenue, but it's not a big deal. Gazprom will supply more domestically. That's good too. Now, isn't this interesting? And if we look at a map, then we see that, you know, for one, Nord Stream is actually not the only uh, pipeline that connects Russia to Europe. There is an entire network that is still up and running. Really, the only pipeline that is physically damaged is this one here, the, the Nord Stream one, right? But according to Vladimir Putin, and the Russians have been saying that for two years, according to their, uh, to their findings, out of the four actual pipelines that are going to Europe, you know, it's always two of them bundled together, two and two, out of those four, one is actually undamaged and one could carry uh, additional uh, Russian gas straight to Germany. That is, of course, the big difference between uh, pipelines like Nord Stream and the others that go to Europe, which have to traverse at least two more countries in order to reach uh, Central Europe. You can see that the Jamal Europe um, pipeline actually goes through Belarus and Poland in order to reach Germany. Then we have the uh, Brotherhood pipeline that goes through Ukraine. We have a, a, one more pipeline, the Soyuz pipeline that also goes through Ukraine. And all of these pipelines are, of course, susceptible to uh, to A, sabotage, but B, more importantly, these pipelines haven't been destroyed. These pipelines have at some point uh, been disrupted by the host governments actually cutting off or threatening to cut, cutting off the flow of energy. I mean, e interestingly enough, even while Russia and Ukraine are at war with each other, some, some gas still flows through the pipelines. And that's the one that especially Hungary uh, and uh, Slovakia uh, uh, want and need in order to keep their economies running. And then we have, of course, the pipelines in the south that go through the Black Sea and then connect Turkey. We have a couple of pipelines planned here, the, the dotted ones that are not yet in existence, but that should be built in the, in the future, a new South Stream pipeline, uh, one that even in the end might connect Greece to uh, and Italy. So these projects are there. And I think what Vladimir Putin in this discussion was talking about with, uh, with his guests in the Far East is that the, that the current decision of the Europeans is actually out of what you would expect from like the ordinary way that the last 30 years of cooperation worked and that we can expect this to come back at some point. And that the yes, while the Ukraine, while the war in Ukraine is certainly the primary motivations for the Europeans to switch this off, it hurts them more than it hurts Russia. And this is the point where we really need to emphasize how this entire game with the with the sanctions failed. And I don't need to tell anyone what a big what a big own goal the sanctions were, but at least on the face of it, the European Union still can pretend that its sanctions worked because certain indicators went down. And, you know, they do that constantly. I'll talk about this graph in a second, but just like just to, to tell you, like if you read Borrell's um, uh, blog, Mr. Borrell has a blog and it's, it's an even very poorly maintained one. Here on the on the homepage of the diplomatic service of the European Union, where he writes regularly, or at least he's being 
uh, it's being published under his name. Although like if you read this, you can really imagine how he could say nonsense like this, um, how closing the tap on Russian gas re-exports is now the new game of the European Union. Uh, it's a stupid article in which he like already starts with something stupid. Our sanctions have already significantly weakened the Russian economy. And then he has proof because there's a link to the how he weakened the Russian economy. <laughs> Funnily enough, though, the link actually links to another to another article that he wrote himself. No, time is not on Russia's side. That's actually the link where it leads to. So in order to prove his point, Mr. Borrell cites himself where he made allegations in another one. But that's beside the point. Uh, all I want to say is that the European, the EU narrative is still that uh, there are indicators that show that the Russia that Russia is suffering and that it's especially its oil revenue went down, right? The whole rationale is that uh, Europe doesn't buy oil anymore, oil and gas from Russia, and therefore its revenue collapses and it cannot use that money for the war in Ukraine, therefore you're weakening the war effort. That's the dumb logic. But two things. First of all, yes, the Russian energy exports to the EU measured in billions of dollars has definitely undisputedly declined, right? If you if we look at where Russian exports were like in January uh, 2020, uh, 2022, right before uh, the special military operation, uh, the, you can see that they exported like 16 billion US dollars worth of oil to the European Union. And although I must say these fluctuations here, they, they also heavily depend on the price of oil in the market. I mean, we all know how volatile um, oil prices are, right? So that drastically declined um, over the course of one year, right? It's not at zero. Uh, countries like Hungary and Slovakia and uh, even, even the Germans and, and the British to some point uh, still import a little bit of, uh, of oil or gas from, from Russia. Um, over here you can see we are not at zero. We never went to zero, but we are now in the 1, 1. 1.5 billion US dollar worth of oil range, so definitely down. But, but, the important thing is that from the Russian perspective, this decline is anything but uh, uh, dramatic, because at the moment their, um, their mineral fuel exports are increasing again. This chart here is quite interesting. Uh, Russian mineral fuel exports by destination, uh, again men, uh, measured in billion dollars between 2019 and 2023. And you can see the EU, that's, the, that's uh, this part here, the dark green or dark blue part. And then we have uh, China and we have other countries like India, for instance, that have started buying much more uh, uh, mineral fuels from Russia and you can see clearly how there is a there is a drop there's a steep drop right uh, between 2022 20, uh, and 2023 but already now this these um, revenues that the, that the Russians can make are increasing again right I mean by the end by December 2023 and the chart unfortunately doesn't have the data for 2024 but by the end of 2023 um, Russian um, earnings measured in billion dollars were at 20 billion US dollars, which is significantly higher than the less than 15 billion in revenue in, Mar in January 2021. So the R Russia is doing better now than back in 2021 when there, was no, when there was no war. And I'm not saying that war is a good thing or anything like that. I'm just saying that this whole narrative that the Russians are um, being being uh, being stifled and that Russian um, gas and oil exports are not giving the Russians enough uh, uh, money in order to fuel their war. That's a stupid narrative. But I just also want to point out the, the other thing is that these are revenues earned now in various um, in various currencies. The Russia used to sell its oil in USD and right before the uh, Nord Stream pipeline was sabotaged, the Russians actually changed to demanding payment from the European Union in Russian ruble. So 
This is not money that directly goes into the war effort. This is money th that, the, that the Russian state uses in general in order to purchase things left and right um, in the outside, especially if these trades are denominated not in Russian ruble, but let's say in Japanese yuan or in Indian rupee, then the Russian state can use those revenues in order to um, buy things again from these countries. Um, the, the, the link that the European Union tries to make time and again between oil revenues and the ability of fighting the war is utterly dumb. It's just not true. This is not what uh, Russia depends upon in order to fight the war. Actually having access to these uh, hydrocarbons uh, and being able to use them for their own military is of course way more important than the, than the money to th that, that comes out from this. So Russia has a real economy that is able to support and sustain the war that it is fighting in Ukraine. It's not the monetary side that is the problem, it is the resource side. And actually the way that the war on the battlefield works out is proving that the question to states is what kind of real resources do I have, which includes uh, hydrocarbons, which includes manpower, which includes access to minerals and, uh, and rare earths and access to even microchips and the, and the ability to produce those, right? Those are the questions. The money part is lies on top of that, but it is a sideshow, at least at this point of the um, of existential uh, of, of existential struggles. So overall, I would say that Vladimir Putin in um, Vladimir Putin's show that he that he gave in Vladivostok tells us that uh, on the one hand, he of course wants to impress his hosts and he wants to he wants to signal certain um, rationality toward the East Asian partners. He brings everything back to this discourse, right, about what makes sense and what not. It signals definitely that Russia wants to portray itself as a reliable partner towards these other um, other partners on the on the global stage towards toward China, toward Malaysia, and through Malaysia, then of course also to ASEAN. It's portraying that it can be depended on in order to live up to to promises. As it the Russia tries very hard to say, like it's not us who stopped the oil; it's the other side that doesn't want to receive it anymore, which is dumb. It's actually something that um, most of the audience um, probably understands. And the one thing that it tells me also is that I think Vladimir Putin is expecting, in the long run these things to go back to normal, which is why they are planning South Stream, which is why they are cooperating with Turkey on these uh, on, on further pipelines. What current what is going on with this interruption of oil flows is an unnatural state, which is owed to the fact that there's this um, temporary conflict that prevents the Europeans from using the access to the most to the closest and cheapest uh, energy source which is Russia but that Vladimir Putin expects this to go back and that he actually keeps signaling that we can go back dear Europeans anytime just let me know we'll turn on the taps again and you can have again uh, your industry back and Germany you actually don't have to deindustrialize if you don't want to just let us know. I think that's actually a, at least not a bad message in order to maybe at some point empower those segments in the German and Central European uh, polities that would actually like to go back and that have a saner approach at economic and industrial issues. Think of uh, Sarah Wagenknecht's party in Germany, think of some of the visions that are coming from right-wing parties in France and Italy. This energy game is not over and Vladimir Putin is positioning himself already to again um, benefit from the return to normal relations on the continent.